Hello, everyone. Um, I'm happy you were able to uh, join us today. And um, uh, we have today a special guest, Professor Ovidiu Ivanku, who is joining us via this uh, online uh, meeting. And uh, he will give a brief um, lecture. And then after that, we and he especially is open to um, uh, discussions and we encourage this uh, dialogue related to uh, the intercultural transfer that we are talking about today. Okay, um, your presentation, I have uploaded a brief presentation of Professor Ivanku on, uh, on the other platform. He is nowadays a um, um, associate professor at the University of Vilnius and um, he has a, a tremendous experience, intercultural experience, but maybe he will be um, telling us about it in his lecture today. So, Professor Ivanku, welcome. Uh, thank you. Thank you very, mu very much, Paul, uh, for your kind introduction. Thank you all for being here. I hope um, everything is okay, technically speaking, so you are able to see me and hear me. I want to share the screen with you uh, because I prepared um, a PowerPoint presentation. And what I want to, to stress is that I will try to combine a theoretical framework, a theoretical background with some of my personal experiences, hoping that uh, this way I encourage all of you to have a lively and interesting dis discussion after my presentation. I will be speaking about intercultural transfer. And of course, you study, um, you study this subject, so uh, perhaps you know a few theoretical uh, backgrounds uh, referring to this uh, this intercultural transfer. I will not spend too much time discussing about definitions and um, I prefer to focus on perceptions and on the way we can actually concretely integrate the theory into our everyday life. My presentation will cover the, the following points. Uh, I will try to give an answer to a question that seems quite obvious. What is culture? And I will try to give you the definition that I want to work with. And we will discuss about culture as it is defined and understood by the Dutch sociologist Hert Hofstede. So we will briefly discuss uh, the Hofstede's model, uh, and uh, we have as a hypothesis for our discussion uh, his definition about culture. After that, we will try to analyze the process of intercultural uh, transfer using a Richard D. Lewis paradigm, and I will be speaking about, um, about uh, this paradigm. A brief theoretical background, and of course, I want to discuss with you about something that apparently is not necessarily connected to uh, the intercultural transfer. I want to discuss about Plato and Oscar Wilde. There are centuries behind them, but um, I will give you a perspective that perhaps might, uh, might contribute to a new or a different understanding of the cultural transfer. And of course, everything will be filtered through my personal experience. And um, I will try, as I told you, to combine theory with personal considerations and personal uh, experiences. Let's start. What is culture? There are so many definitions. There are so many schools of thought. I propose to you to work with this definition because it suits the purpose of my lecture. For Herd Hofstede, culture is, a, is a, the collective programming of the mind that distinguish the members of one group or category of people from others. And if you want, you can find out more about his theory by reading his book, 
uh, culture and organization software of the mind. Now, if you check this definition, if you want to accept this definition, perhaps you will be firstly scared. How can be culture a collective programming of the mind? Well, what what well what uh, Herd Hofstede understands by collective programming of the mind is the fact that our identity, our culture, is shaped by the stories that are told about us. From the very beginning, we hear stories about who we are, about the language that we speak, about our history. And this is uh, what um, later will define our identity. So culture as a collective programming of the mind. Please keep in mind, and I think this is really important, that uh, Herr Hofstede doesn't speak here about nations, doesn't speak here about doesn't speak here about countries or nationalities, because culture, if we want to understand the concept, to grasp the meaning of the concept, I think that we should perceive culture as a notion or as a pro uh, process that transgresses nation or nationality or even uh, borders. Now, uh, in the following the same, uh, the same argument, uh, I want to talk to you uh, about uh, Richard D. Lewis and his book, When Cultures Collide, Leading Across Cultures. And you have here one of uh, my favorite quotes from this book. We think our minds are free, but like, but like captured American pilots in Vietnam or in North Korea, we have been thoroughly brainwashed. Collective programming in our culture begun in the cradle and reinforced in kindergarten, school and the workplace convinces us that we are normal, others eccentric. Now, the question is, if we accept this uh, definition and if we accept that there is some truth behind uh, this quote, the question is, what happens with an individual when he or she is forced by various, various um, 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 biographical accidents to cross borders and to um, to dive into a different culture. What happens with your own uh, culture meets a different one. And uh, here I have some experience that I want to share with you. And um, it's time perhaps now to discuss about um, the personal background that I want to introduce into this lecture. My personal experience includes uh, four years of teaching in India between 2000, 2009 uh, 2013. Then um, uh, two academic years in Republic of Moldova, in the southern part of Republic of Moldova, in, um, in uh, an area called uh, Gagauzia. And of course, five years already, this is the fifth year, fifth academic year in Lithuania, uh, where I teach for a university of Vilnius. So we have the theoretical background, we have my personal background, now try to combine them both in such a way that we um, are able to catch a glimpse on, on, on the, the intercultural transfer and what exactly it means. First of all, um, I want to start by saying that <clears throat> this notion, this concept, is not at all new. It was coined some, some decades ago, but of course, with, uh, with the development of this global world that we live in, the concept uh, changed uh, its uh, meaning. And you see here that the concept was originally developed in, um, in, uh, in the 20th century, for the study of exchange processes between France and Germany in the time of the Enlightenment and the French Revolution. Intercultural transfer is a process 
that deals with how um, values and systems of beliefs from one culture contaminate and I don't use this word, word negatively, contaminate a different culture. How cultures exchange beliefs, ideas, myths, and it can be expanded. This concept can be expanded um, because we can talk about intercultural transfer when we speak about technology, when we speak about economy, but these are fields that are kind of alien to me, so I will not, uh, I will not um, speak more about them. I told you that uh, I, I intend to tell you a story about uh, two, um, two ideas, main ideas, that might help us have a better understanding on, um, the, on the intercultural transfer. And I have here, and you see in front of you, um, a hypothesis. If we accept that culture comprises fiction, if we accept that what we know about us is a sum of stories that are told, uh, and if we accept the idea that identity is built by uh, enforcing and reinforcing constantly national narratives, then perhaps we should um, accept the idea that intercultural transfer is an exchange of fictions. Now, perhaps you, perhaps you, you know, when I say fiction, I do not mean to say something that is not true. Uh, when I say fiction, I mean to say everything that doesn't have, um, doesn't have a correspondent into uh, an objective reality. Um, perhaps you are familiar with the, um, with the Israeli historian Yuval Noah Harari. He speaks about fiction and he says that money is fiction economy is fiction simply because they do not have any kind of um, uh, objective representation. They do not mean anything. A tree is not a fiction because it belongs to a reality that we can see and observe and existed before us and probably, hopefully, will exist after us. While a fiction is something that we humans created but in time, our fictions um, manage to influence our life. And this is how I understand fiction here. So let's start the story. Let's go back to ancient Greek and discuss how Plato and Aristotle saw the idea of art and fiction. They, uh, they believed that art imitates life. Well, there is a difference between Aristotle and Plato. One of them thinks that this is a good thing. The other one thinks that this is not necessarily a good or a positive thing. But both uh, believe in the same idea. And for many centuries, for many centuries, this was the central idea. Art imitates life. Uh, what can be more coherent than that? You have a painting and the painter paints what he or she sees in reality. You have a book and the writer depicts what he or she observes in the real world. It sounds coherent, it sounds normal, it sounds um, easy to understand. But in the 19th century, we have a change of paradigm. And Oscar Wilde in The Decay of Lying in 1889, said something that apparently doesn't make too much sense. Life imitates art far more than art imitates life. What does it mean? While it is very easy to understand Plato and Aristotle, art imitates life, it is extremely difficult to understand Oscar Wilde. How comes that reality 
becomes not um, a subject of inspiration, but something else. Life imitates art. How can life, a real thing, can imitate art, fiction? And Oscar Wilde gives a lot of arguments for his idea, but I want to, um, to exemplify, I want to um, discuss this idea, but by giving you a personal example, and I'm very curious if you relate to my example in a way or another. I thought about it when I've read uh, something about a strange experiment, but unfortunately, I don't remember. I don't remember the the the, the novel I've read this experiment uh, in. Uh, but anyway, it doesn't matter. I want to tell you uh, the story. Let's suppose that you have to change uh, planes in an airport and you have to wait for many hours for your plane. And you decide in the airport to go uh, to eat something or to drink a coffee. Well, there is always, for a few seconds at least, the absurd expectation that when you go there, when you enter this alien space, there is this expectation that something interesting might, see, interesting might happen to you. There is the expectation then that, oh, perhaps I meet some, someone interesting, perhaps, perhaps I have an interesting conversation while waiting the plane in the cafe or in the restaurant. In most of the cases, this doesn't happen. And those hours where you wait in the airport are hours of horrible boredom, nothing happens. Now the question is, where, this, where, this expect, where does this expectation come from? How comes that I, as an individual, expect that something interesting out of the ordinary might happen to me when I have to spend some time in an airport, in a restaurant or a cafe, waiting for my plane? And the answer to this question um, makes us understand, makes us have a better understanding of what Oscar Wilde say, says. This expectation comes from movies and art. Whenever you have a movie where you have a character waiting for the plane in a cafe or in a restaurant, something interesting happens. And because this is a cliche that we find everywhere in life, in, in, in art, whether we talk about movies, we talk about books, we talk about any kind of or any form of art, this cliche became so powerful that it became part of our mindset. And although we don't have rational reasons to believe that something interesting might happen to us while waiting the plane, we still have, at least for a few seconds, this expectation. Well, this example, and I'm very curious if you have similar examples or if, if you experience the same, the same feeling that I, that I was describing here. This example proves uh, or shows that Oscar Wilde um, had a great intuition. In our modern time, stories are more than stories. They become part of our mindset and they become part of our reality. How does this connect with the intercultural transfer? When you move from, from one space to another space, especially if the spaces are very different, you go to the new space carrying with you a collection of stories, a collection of stories about who you are, a collection of stories about your history, a collection of stories, stories about your identity. And you find yourself in a new place where people have different stories or different identities. And the question is, what happens to you? Um, I experienced this in India for the first time when, uh, when I arrived and I do not know if this is relevant for 
what generally people experience in these situations, but my first initial reaction was to resist. The stories that I was carrying within me um, refused to uh, be subdued by, by a different type of culture. So I tried to resist. I tried to preserve in a way or another my values, my systems of beliefs, my identity, so on and so forth. But something interesting happened, and we will discuss this later on. No matter how much I tried to resist, the culture that I was uh, in the middle of found always a way to to change what I was. And this is important why? Because my conjecture is that intercultural transfer is an unintentional process and an unavoidable process. You cannot fight it. You cannot oppose anything to it. It happens. And I think that this story about Aristotle and Plato, and later on in the 19th century, Oscar Wilde, explains or illustrates what happens to an individual when um, he or she has to, um, has to dive into a culture that is so different from his own or her own uh, culture. Now, uh, here you have, uh, you have some pictures. It doesn't matter uh, how relevant are these pictures for my, for, my, uh, for my experience, personal experience, but I want to discuss about them uh, because uh, there are some metaphors that I want to introduce here. As I told you, I strongly believe that um, the intercultural transfer is a process that has three key features. First of all, it is unintentional. Second of all, it is continuous. And third of all, it is inexorable. It is inevitable. It is unavoidable. And I want to uh, give you my arguments. Why is it unintentional? If you remember when we discussed about um, Gerd Herd Hofstede's definition of culture, we tried to define culture as, um, as mind programming. Well, this mind programming happens not always with an intention. Of course, when we discuss about ideologies, there might be an intention. When we discuss about, for example, the Romanian culture or history during communism, there might be an intention be behind the stories that we were told and we thought are true. But in most of the cases, this amazing process is unintentional. No one tries to manipulate you in any way. No one tries, you to, tries to feed you stories hoping that um, they, will, they will control your mind. This happens only in movies. The intercultural transfer is a very subtle process. It happens even without you being aware of it, even without you being, being conscious of what happens to you. You are in the middle of a culture that is very different from the culture that you are used to, and you have to, not necessarily to adapt, but you have to find ways to function. And in India, um, uh, you, have a, you have a picture from India on the, um, on the left side of the screen. Uh, you see that behind uh, uh, there is uh, one, of the, one of the symbols of, um, of modern India, India Gate. This is a picture from New Delhi. Uh, why did I choose this symbol and not uh, the, the Taj Mahal or any other temples that, uh, that they have and they are very proud of? I chose this symbol because it seems to me uh, ironic. India Gate is a reminiscence of the colonial time. And 
today it is the symbol of modern independent India. So you see, the symbol of a country is something that uh, encompasses various, various um, um, types of, of cultures. We have the British culture, we have the modern uh, uh, Indian culture, so on, so on and so forth. Going back to uh, what I tried to, um, uh, to discuss, I think, I think the intercultural uh, process is unintentional. It happens without you being aware of that. It affects you. Then the second key feature, uh, this is a continuous process. It never stops. And now you might ask me, well, how comes that it never stops? You can live the entire, your, your entire life in your village or in your city, and then there is no intercultural transfer. Well, there is. Uh, we live in a world where even if we don't move, cultures move to reach us. And uh, this reminds me of a very interesting idea expressed in one of the novels of uh, Vasile Ernu, a very interesting uh, uh, contemporary Romanian writer. He says something like, history is not only or mainly about ideas and revolutions and ideologies. History is about objects because objects might have a greater impact on who we are or on our culture than ideas or history. And then he gives the example of, um, of, the of, a, of a banal uh, bottle of Coca-Cola. And he says, a bottle of Coca-Cola changed more in how people perceive the West and the United States than many other revolutions or ideas. So this is a continuous process. Inter intercultural transfer is a continuous process. It, it, it never stops. Even if you don't move, even if you get stuck in one, in one space, um, there is always an exposure to different cultures. And of course, this exposure um, has a different magnitude when you travel, when you spend many years in, in different countries. Uh, and for me, uh, one of the most transforming experiences in terms of, um, in terms of how I perceive my identity was living in India. Uh, after living in India, going to Republic of Moldova and being here in Lithuania is not so, so, so difficult because, um, the process is already completed in a way. When I arrived in India, uh, I thought somehow that um, my system of beliefs uh, and my system of values are very, very, very firm and solid. And um, then, the first thing that I realized when I arrived there was something that for me was almost painful, almost physically painful. I realized that I do not understand. So for the first, for the first time in, life, in, in my life, I, I, I realized that I cannot make sense of the reality around me. I do not understand how things or work, even the, even the most, the most um, um, common things around me. So this forced me somehow to question uh, myself. And when I talk to you about transfer, transfer, uh, intercultural transfer, intercultural transfer, um, I want you to, to believe that this notion is not only an abstract scholarly notion. Behind it, behind the theory, uh, there lays a, a, a very concrete reality. And perhaps some of you experienced it, but perhaps some of you will experience uh, this um, intercultural transfer firsthand. And when I realized 
I cannot make sense of the world around me and I do not understand how the world around me functioned. The next step was um, the denial. Uh, this is an essential step in the, uh, in the process of intercultural trans transfer. What do I mean by denial? Um, I had a tendency to think, to believe that my values, my world, uh, the stories that I was told are in a way better than what I found there. And this is, again, a very painful process because it is part of the resistance. You try to resist to a, to a culture that seems very alien to you. Um, and it lasted for at least one year and a half, this part of the process, uh, where I tried to impose my cultural beliefs, my cultural values, um, thinking that this is a form of resistance to something that is completely alien uh, to what you are. But eventually one day, uh, and now we start discussing about the third key feature of the process, inexorable. So eventually one day I realized that even without me knowing, even without me being aware of what happened, um, I got contaminated. And the first moment I realized that was when I returned to Romania after um, one year uh, in, 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 in India. I, I just returned to Romania briefly for perhaps 10 days or, or, or two weeks. And I realized that um, I brought with me part of what I experienced there. And this is uh, very interesting and traumatic at the same time because um, it is, perhaps you are aware, perhaps, perhaps you know uh, Homi Baba, one of, one of the prominent scholars that talks about uh, the global world, world and globalization. So he says something like, uh, globalization starts at home. So people travel, you bring with you different experiences, and then you come back, but you are a different person. And this is why I think, based on my personal experience this time, I might be wrong because, ob because obviously I know that personal experience is not always relevant when we talk about uh, a subject and we try to um, to be very, very accurate and scientific in our approach. But based on my personal experience, I think that this process, intercultural transfer, is inexorable. It cannot be avoided. Um, of course, if you have any kind of questions about, um, about the ideas that I expressed, um, I, can, I can elaborate. Uh, in Lithuania now, I don't experience the same, uh, the same kind of cultural shock, but still this process of intercultural transfer is present. It happens every day. And um, perhaps now if you ask me something about my identity, I have problems in defining my cultural identity because obviously I am Romanian and still uh, the stories about my Romanian identity are very strong and perhaps they will always be very strong but somewhere in the background there are some other experiences that are also now part of who I am and I cannot clearly distinguish what is in my cultural identity Romanian what is Indian, what is Lithuanian, um, but this is not a tragedy. This is not something that we should perceive as a negative process. Uh, on the contrary, I think. And now, um, these are some of the ideas that I wanted to, uh, to discuss with you.
As I told you, uh, my idea was to try and um, combine the theoretical approach with uh, my personal experience and how this intercultural transfer uh, actually works in practice. Thank you for listening and I strongly hope um, we, we, can, uh, we can have a lively discussion about the ideas that I expressed about your personal experiences. Feel, feel free to contradict me if you have a different approach, if you have a different view on the ideas that I uh, expressed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ovidiu, for your presentation. It was lovely. I'm now inviting all those present uh, here today to voice their questions or comments. Please feel free to interact. Okay, hello. I uh, admit that uh, I'm pretty sure that I've read your book about your experience in India a few years ago. And um, I recommend to my colleagues to read it because it's very interesting for me, it, it was. Uh, actually, I felt like I, um, I'm there with you and um, I was feeling your cultural shock. Um, because uh, we all know, or personally, I know India from my tray, from Rujni, but no, uh, uh, I never saw India with the eyes of a Romanian. So thank you for that. And I would like to ask you something. Uh, do you think that we can escape of this collective programming uh, of mind that you talk? or uh, this uh, collective programming is always with us and uh, um, so it is possible or uh, we have to be uh, for a long time in contact with a culture to um, escape our stories that you told us or about our fictions. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, for, for reading the, my book, first of all, and then for the question. Um, you mentioned Salman Rushdie. Uh, he says in one of his novels that actually all the conflicts between humans, they have the same source. They are conflicts between stories. I believe in my side of the story. You believe in your side of the story. And when we fight, we don't fight each other. Our stories fight. Now, your question, if we can, if we can uh, escape or evade oh, yeah. from this cultural pr uh, programming, um, I think we can, but only in... A, in we, we escape a cultural programming and we replace it with a different programming yes i think so <laughs> and i don't think and i don't think i don't think there is anything tragic in it uh, it's it's part of who we are uh, the fact that we have a language an articulated language and we use it for expressing abstract uh, notions the fact that we have the language to 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 express or to create or invent stories shows that um, there is no point in trying to escape. I, I, cannot, I cannot possibly imagine an individual uh, without, without, without stories, without this cultural programming. What are we without it? But the, yes. but the problem is, the problem is to, to try to become, and this is what I, this is what I try to do. I don't know if I, if I succeeded, but I want to become a programmer myself. I want to be able to, 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 to write the program. Okay, perhaps not all of it, but I want to be, to be able to understand how it works and to be able to alter it and to understand what happens to me in terms of 
in terms of my identity. And I think this is the maximum that we can hope for. We cannot hope for uh, for 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 a world where we don't have this cultural programming. It would be very tragic if you ask me, because in the absence of culture and cultural programming, we are social animals plus the minus the part with the social. I don't know. Okay. Probably. <laughs> You're welcome. You. All right. If there's anyone else who would like to jump in, please uh, feel free to do so. Okay. Then I'll have a brief question for your video. After all these um, years abroad, um, how do you see yourself nowadays? Are you the same 100% um, Romanian, 100% already programmed? How much of you is still there and how much has been reprogrammed based on other cultures? Thank you for the question. It's it's really complicated to determine in percentage what happens because everything is a very uh, everything is a mixture and a, a, a melting pot. But what happened to me, and I think it started happening when I when I went to India, was that I got rid of um, of this feeling of belonging. Uh, of course, I am Romanian, I speak Romanian, I have a Romanian passport, I have a Romanian citizenship, but in India I, ex I, exper I experimented the first time uh, uh, this displacement, and as a result of it, I think I got rid... I, I do not identify, for example, with... Um, Okay, let's, let's try a different approach. You know, there was a time in my life, and perhaps there is still, uh, there is still the case with, with others, when, um, whenever I met Romanian abro Romanians abroad, I had a tendency for perhaps a few seconds or a few minutes to communicate with them, to feel that we belong to the same space. Well, I don't have it anymore. So I, I started somehow uh, connecting with people based on something else apart from the language we speak or the nationality we have or we share. Um, it is very difficult to explain how it happens, but I think this is one of the most uh, most important things that uh, that happened to me. Uh, I'm I'm okay in Romania, I'm okay in Lithuania, I'm okay, well, in India, I don't know, because I wouldn't go there too soon, but, um, but I started um, selecting, selecting my circle of, not necessarily friends, but of people whom I want to interact with, according to some criteria, and in my criteria, none of uh, 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 the nationality or the language we speak doesn't play any kind of role, but any kind of role. And I think this is this is what what happened uh, what happened to me. Does, does this make me uh, less patriotic? I don't know, perhaps, but it doesn't matter. This is what happens, and this is the reality. So, yeah, great. Thank you. Is there anyone else for a question or comment? Uh, I would have a question, if it's possible. Sure. Uh, hello. So I would like to ask you, how how is the transition between country to country? You mentioned that you you were in three countries, teaching and also Romania. So there are four countries. How is the transition from country to country, and how is it 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 is to adapt, for example, and to I don't know, feel like you belong in a specific country. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I have a friend and 
he knows, uh, I don't know, six or seven foreign languages. And he told me something. He told me after the third foreign language, everything is easy. And going back to your question, I think uh, the first serious shock, but I mean serious shock, was in India. After that, everything came naturally. Uh, it happens like everything happens in life. You discover one day that there is no Santa Claus and you cry. But then years after, you get over it. And each Christmas, you leave the, the you, you, you experience the, 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 the joy of Christmas being aware that Santa Claus uh, does not exist. I think it's the same. Um, it's not like I had a choice. The, this, is, this is very interesting. So it's not like I chose to do that. I chose to go to India, but I chose that because I didn't know what India was. If I knew, I wouldn't choose it. So it was not a choice. It happened like most of our cultural experiences happen in life. I was forced to do it. And then I didn't have any way out. The only thing is to just stay there and stand. And this is how it works. And this reminds me of, um, of something that perhaps Bill Gates or... Well, it's not safe to quote Bill Gates during COVID-19 pandemic, but I will do that anyway. So he was asked, uh, well, one of these uh, very banal questions, what is the secret of success? And uh, he or someone else said something very interesting. The secret to success is to show up, to be there. So when you meet the opportunity, when you have the opportunity, you jump. You are there when, when, the, when the train arrives in the train station. And then once you are inside the train, then you move with it and your journey starts. But everything starts with this very, very easy to do thing. It's, it's not about how brilliant you are. It's not about how educated you are. It's about showing up. And when you have an opportunity, you jump and you take it. Um, I would like to think that uh, all my experiences have to do have have to do with me being bright or smart, but it doesn't have to do with that. It, it there is no connection whatsoever. Uh, it's simply it's simply being there, taking the train, and going with the train where it takes you. Uh, and once you experience this once, then everything becomes easier. Thank you for your answer, and I'm I'm really looking forward to to read your book. Our our colleague mentioned so, looking forward. Don't, to it. don't buy it; just uh, borrow it from your colleague. It's kind of it's okay. twenty five lay or something, so it's too expensive. Just borrow it from your colleague, or 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 try to download it illegally. Uh, well, we can't say that it's a recording in progress. So buy it, please. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Ovidio. Actually, this uh, I feel like it's my fault. Uh, I failed to mention uh, the book uh, Adelina has brought up. It is indeed Vremia um, Musonului, no? the time of the monsoon, four years in India, Padruan in India. Uh, it's uh, a book published a few years ago by Ovidio at Acon Publishing House. I have read it. It is a tremendous reading. So I do indeed recommend you all and it, it is, is, is very uh, relevant for the topic of, uh, of this meeting uh, yeah yeah so I congratulate your video and um, I kind of hope I will um, get to read uh, a sequel of that uh, particular book um, about your years in Lithuania although I imagine that won't be nearly as exotic as as uh, the one about India, but the <laughs> problem is that I'm, I'm I'm older and I'm less brave, because in India I didn't have this censorship. So I, I I wrote about what happened, about real characters, real 
while now being a bit older, I kind of, you know, uh, I can't afford anymore to be brutally honest about my colleagues and about what happens to me. So, unfortunately, this happens with all of us. Self-censorship. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so, if anyone else has some questions or comments, um, please feel free to do so. No? All right. Uh, then we could um, stop here. Um, Ovidio, do you have some final comments, maybe, to sum up? Um, yes, uh, I, I, I just um, want, first of all, to thank you all for, for being here. And I want to encourage you to see, to see beyond the concepts, beyond the theory. Um, I know, and this happens to my students also, I know that perhaps time to time you think that discussing about intercultural transfer, this kind of concepts is dry and it doesn't help you too much and uh, it's boring. But beyond this dry theoretical background, there is something that happens to all of us and will happen to all of us. The whole trick is to try to find the connection between, between, between the concepts and the dry theory and your own personal experience. And although there are people who think that bringing the personal experience into the academic field uh, kind of is not very professional, I'm one of the, of the teachers who believe that this is the only hope for humanities because we do not study chemistry or physics or we study humanities. And do not forget what George Steiner said uh, several decades ago, humanities don't humanize anymore. Humanities is not about not only about concepts and dry concepts, humanity is about us. Because otherwise, uh, humanity doesn't have any meaning. Why do we study it? So this is what I want to, to encourage you to see um, in, your, in, your, in your studies, that there is a connection between what you study and what we all experience um, in our uh, real everyday life. Thank you, Ovidio. On that note, uh, we conclude our meeting today. Thank you all for being here, for chipping in with questions and comments. Um, I'll see you all to the next opportunity that we'll hope we'll have. Thank you, Ovidio. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Have a nice day.